Last night, you enthusiastically endorsed the tax simplification concept and said you've instructed the Treasury to fashion a final bill. The word from some parts of the business community is that one part of that deal has already been struck, namely that you will change the Treasury proposals and continue favorable capital gains tax treatment and accelerated depreciation, and in return that uh, you would uh, continue the present taxation of dividends. Is that general, the general direction you wish to head? Well, let me just say about that, that I'm hard put to answer a specific question of that kind. We were faced with the two problems, the one of what we want, the tax reform, the other with the necessity of coming in with a budget. We have been long hours around that cabinet table on the budget matter and finally have now submitted it. We have not yet begun that process on the tax program. I think, as I've said before, I think that Treasury uh, study was probably the finest and broadest study that's been made of the tax structure that I can ever remember. Mm -hmm. And I hesitate to give any opinion on any single thing until, again, those of us who sat around the table on the, the budget uh, are going to sit around that same table now on the tax program and go at every facet of it. I think we recognize that in that study, I don't think anyone has said, well, I buy this entirely as it is, we recognize there are things in there that are options. And so I, I, won't, I don't think that I uh, could or should uh, give an answer on a specific of that kind. Well, apart from the specifics, sir, it's, it's been argued that venture capital has helped uh, fuel the American economy in recent years. Yep. I think you agree with that. Does it worry you that by eliminating the special treatment given to capital gains that that might kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs? Well, this is going to be a consideration. This is one is of the that things a that... Is real worry? Yes. And uh, so I think that this would be one of the points that will be uh, very much discussed because the whole aim of both of these things, well, in addition to the tax reform being necessary to eliminate a lot of unfairness and the biggest unfairness of all is the complexity of the present tax system. Uh, but in addition to that, we're looking to these both as things necessary for economic growth. And therefore, we're going to look at this tax proposal and at anything as to whether it could contribute or uh, to economic growth or whether it could set economic growth back. Is that a suggestion you'd like to keep the current uh, capital gains tax treatment? No, you, you're getting me to <laughs> give an opinion on it. No, what I'm saying is we will be giving each of these things consideration on that basis that I just outlined. Let me ask you another concept question then. Uh, you said last night that the individual tax rates would be no higher than 35 percent, perhaps even lower. Well, the way the Treasury proposal lowers individual tax rates is by increasing corporate taxes by 37 percent. Again, uh, as a concept, is that, do you generally favor that approach of individual versus corporate uh, taxes? Oh, wait a minute. The corporate tax is uh, given a ceiling of lower than the... Uh... No, but overall corporate taxes would go up about 37 uh, percent. Not, not the rates, but overall corporate taxes would go up about 37 percent under the Treasury proposal, well, while individual taxes would come down. Is that a general approach that you, that you endorse? Of, uh, I, as I say, I haven't even made an attempt to study that uh, bill in detail that much uh, uh, to know that. I assume that that would mean uh, uh, things that would be taken away from them that are uh, present deductions. No, I'm. Uh, I would have to be convinced uh, of the need to do that because uh, I am a believer that uh, one day we must recognize that. Uh, only people pay taxes, and uh, someday I would hope that we could arrive at a tax structure that would uh, recognize that you can't tax things, you only tax people. Well, you, you also said last night that this was not going to be a tax increase uh, mm -hmm. under, under any, any disguise. Uh, let me turn that around and, and ask if the bill is modified to meet the objections of some critics, whether it's from the business community or elsewhere, uh, could it be that the bill would be a revenue loser and would that be acceptable to you? Well, no, I think what we're talking about here is a tax reform and you're, you're striving for neutrality uh, in this. Now, in such, that kind of a reform, 
I'm also sure that there are going to be some people, uh, obviously, who are going to pay more tax than they're paying now. But then you're talking about people who are unfairly not paying a share of the tax today. And if you, uh, the aim of this kind of a tax program, and I think this is true of all uh, three of the proposals that are now before us, the two that are up in the Congress now, plus this Treasury report, I think it is true that one of the targets there is the large amount of tax that is not being paid uh, many times legally by virtue of the complexities of the present tax laws in which some who fairly should be paying a share are avoiding it. And with the simplification comes a straightening out of that kind of a, of a problem. But you want your final bill to be revenue neutral? Yes. And if it is revenue neutral, it will end up uh, actually providing more revenues from the simple reason that you will broaden the base of the economy. Let me try one more tax question, sir. You also spoke favorably about the notion of lowering rates and, as you just said, broadening the base by eliminating many exemptions. But right after you did that, you then called for two new exemptions, namely enterprise zones and tuition tax credits. Doesn't that just encourage others to try to carve out their own special places for their own pet write-offs and threaten to unravel that whole concept of lowering the base by broadening or lowering the rates by broadening the base? Well, if you're trying to make a tax program more fair, which is also part of this proposal, uh, take the issue you've raised of tuition tax credits. Here you have, I think, a very broad-based unfairness in the country. You've got people who are compelled to send their children to school under the law uh, because we believe that only a democracy can only exist if you have an illiterate uh, citizenry. And yet these people who, if they choose or feel they can get a better education for their children, choose a, a, a private or a parochial school independent school of some kind, they pay the full cost of sending their child to that school, but at the same time, they're paying the full cost that parents of children are paying. They're paying that in taxes to support the public school system. Now, if you stop and think what the additional cost to public schools would be if suddenly the independent schools closed and all those students were turned over to the educational market, and it would not mean an increase in revenues for public education because already they're getting the money from those parents. You could see what a burden this would be. Well, it seems to me that it's only fair that some parent, as a matter of fact, the ultimate fairness would be educational vouchers. Does government, does government properly support a school system or does it provide the funds directly to the students to get an education. And there would be public schools available, there would be independent mm -hmm. schools available, they could take that voucher and go where they want and you put competition back into education. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, on the politics of uh, tax simplification, uh, the general idea doesn't seem to have a lot of support among the Senate Republican leadership and the business community has its problems with some of the provisions. And What can you do personally to turn around the opposition from these kinds of people who are normally in your corner on things. And, on, and at the beginning, you said at the beginning what... The Senate uh, on tax simplification. Oh. Well, I think that for some people, uh, simply on the basis of the, what was revealed of the Treasury Department study uh, that read into it things they thought were inimical to their interests and, and immediately took off, but I think in many instances, when you sat down with those people and pointed out what the change in rates did, uh, some of their hostility disappeared. I, I think the most important thing that we're going to face is once we have settled on and agreed on the package that we believe is fair and is the reform that is needed, is then to make sure there's no misunderstanding or lack of understanding of what it will actually mean to the taxpayer. Basically, we found that the overwhelming majority of people were going to get a sizable decrease in taxes uh, based roughly on this, uh, on this setup, and that those that weren't 
we're going to get an increase where people who, as I say, are not presently pay, pay, paying their fair share. More generally on the economy, uh, you've made it pretty clear that you believe that we're on the brink of a sustained economic boom. Uh, are you worried that this might be cut short by the Federal Reserve, and, and would you like to have a greater say in Federal Reserve policy? Well, we try to work very closely, as closely as we can, with the Federal Reserve on this, and they know what it is that we feel is the sound policy. And so far, I must say right now, they're on target. And that is, we need a money supply that is commensurate to the growth in the economy and to continue that growth without inflation. And uh, that provides uh, two lines <laughs> between which you must stay. And uh, so far, that, as I say, right now, they're, they're right on target with that. You're comfortable right now. Were you comfortable uh, back in uh, July and August? I think there were some times when it fluctuated widely and when they uh, uh, got well below their target and all. But, uh, as I say, we're, we're trying to stay in close touch with them, and I think we've made it plain what we believe. I also recognize that there are times their, their tools are not that accurate. There are times when it isn't a, an outright decision of theirs that sees the money supply fluctuating, and the uh, fluctuations can be caused from other and outside forces. But uh, I think we're pretty much in agreement on If we could shift to uh, foreign policy uh, for a moment. Your administration is obviously headed into a battle with Congress over the aid to the Contra forces in Nicaragua. Uh, last night you said that aid was necessary to our own self-defense. Uh, what I keep wondering is, would you like to see the Contras actually overthrow the Sandinista government? And if not, what's the purpose of aiding them? The purpose of aiding them is to aid literally the people of Nicaragua uh, who are striving to get the government that the revolution promised them. If you'll recall that the, uh, during the, the revolution, the revolutionary forces appealed to the Organization of American States for help. And they asked the organization if they would please try to persuade Somoza to step down and thus end the bloodshed. And in return for this, they gave the Organization of American States a declaration of principles of what it was they were seeking in the revolution. And this was pure democracy. This was all the civil rights and human rights, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of labor unions, freedom of religion, and all of these things. Now what happened, we saw happen once before with Castro's coming to power in Cuba. He had other allies that wanted a democracy. And he never admitted to his true leanings until that revolution was over. Well, what happened was the faction known as the Sandinistas took over. They ousted a number of other revolutionary leaders. Some of them were exiled. Some, I think, were done away with. Some imprisoned. But they have set up a totalitarian government. They've made it plain. Their allies are Cuba, the Soviet Union, the communist bloc, even Mr. Gaddafi. And now Iran is getting into the picture. But they've set up a totalitarian government. They have betrayed the principles that the people of Nicaragua were fighting for. And what we, uh, what we think is that we should be on the side of those people who actually are only asking for the democracy that they'd fought a revolution to get. Well, it, it sounds as though you are saying that the objective is an entirely new government in Nicaragua. Would that be fair to conclude? Well, when you, when you answer a question that simply, though, when you come back, then you, see, you, you get into the thing, well, are you talking about individuals? Are you talk, you're talking about the governmental form. Now, if that governmental form can come by way of the people who are presently in that government and who then will be willing to stand for elections at appropriate times, uh, uh, that's fine. But that's what it's really all about, is getting the revolution the people fought for. On a similar kind of question, uh, Secretary Schultz has been giving speeches about the need to retaliate against terrorism, uh, but in fact there hasn't been any re U.S. retaliation for the attacks on our embassies and our Marines, and five Americans right now are being held hostage yes. in Lebanon. Uh, 
Is your policy on using force against terrorism really any different from the Carter administration's? Well, I think you're, you're, you're putting some apples and oranges together there. The Carter situation was not dealing with unknown hidden terrorists. They were dealing with a legitimate government. And uh, not a very good government, but <laughs> at least it was the government of a nation. You knew who you were dealing with. You were dealing with a national entity. The problem with terrorism so far and why, as I've said, the, uh, much of the answer lies in what we're going forward with now, and that is better uh, relationship with all the other democracies to where we'll make extradition easy, we'll exchange intelligence information. You, there are two ways you could, you could deal with terrorism, and one of them is terrorism itself. Suppose uh, in revenge, just on the basis that you think some people of a certain a group or sect or belief did this, and then you strike back and perform the same kind of brutal crimes against some of those people without any knowledge or, that, or uh, assurance that you're getting the people who perpetrated the first crime. Well, that's no way to fight, and we don't believe in that. The thing is, you have to find an ability to locate the source, if possible, the, uh, obviously the best way is if you can infiltrate and then get some advance information on when they're going to strike, uh, be prepared for them. Uh, our problem with the worst terrorist act, the, the big one of course, was our Marines and the Embassy, was nothing but some suspicion of a certain locale in Lebanon and yet there was no way to sort that out or separate it out from a community of other people and no way to strike back without causing a lot of innocents to die. And uh, what we now, I think, uh, are looking at is the possibility that some terrorists actually do have national support and backing. Then. With that established, then you can let that government know that there is going to be redress against that government if uh, these acts continue. On the broad question of arms control and, and the U.S.-Soviet relationship, uh, you talk a lot about arms control agreements with deep cuts and, and offensive weapons and extensive verification. Uh, when you do that, aren't you really asking the Soviet Union to become an entirely different kind of country? Uh, and can we really expect that in our lifetimes? Well, I'm not going to be euphoric about this, but I do think that one of the things we have going for us at this time that hasn't been present in much of our previous negotiations is that we go to the table now in a situation in which you're not going there looking at the Soviets as if, well, they're people just like us and maybe if we talk sweetly enough, why, they will be conned into uh, uh, being nice too. No. The only way you're ever going to succeed in negotiations is if you can go there with a situation in which it is to their practical interest also, that their interests are served by coming to an agreement. And I think the fact that we go there now with our own military buildup, with them seeing that the alternative to legitimate arms reduction could very well be an arms race with an industrial power that they know they cannot match. In other words, we're saying to them, we're not going to let you get a monopoly on power to the point that you can start winning by simple ultimatums, threats of surrender or die. So make up your mind. You either join in a legitimate reduction in which both of us will reduce in such a way that neither one of us represents a threat to the other, or you face that kind of a race. It was all summed up in a cartoon. I know your paper doesn't have cartoons, but uh, sort, of. Uh, sort of, all right. But a cartoon one day, and right back early on in our military rebuilding, and it was two Russian generals, and one of them was saying to the other, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. 
And I think that's been the situation over a number of years. On, and, your, uh, on the military buildup, uh, uh, one of the prominent things is, is the Strategic Defense uh, Initiative. And uh, would you continue to favor this even if your own scientists concluded that it could never be leak-proof? Uh, and that even a few missiles would always get through and destroy cities? Uh. Oh, I've never asked for 100 percent. That'd be a fine goal. But uh, you can have a most effective defensive weapon even if it isn't 100 percent. Because what you would have is the knowledge that, or that the other fellow would have the knowledge that if they launched a first strike that it might be such that not enough of their missiles could get through and in return, we could launch the retaliatory strike. Now, that isn't really the goal of the Strategic Defense Initiative. I tie that to what I think is the goal of these arms negotiations. The Soviet Union, Chernyenko and Gromyko both, have publicly stated that they would like to see the elimination, ultimately, of all nuclear weapons. All right, they've said it. That's what our goal is. Now, if they really mean it, we can go to a table and sit down and start negotiating reductions aiming toward the elimination of those weapons. The, if, they, if they don't mean it, uh, or either way, I think that to go forward with this research on a strategic weapon is hand in hand with that goal, that ultimate goal. If you could have that kind of a, of a defense in which they would have to say, well, wait a minute, how many missiles would we have to build to get enough through on a first attack uh, that we, we wouldn't be threatened with then the retaliation? And <clears throat> then they will see the value that this, this is what I mean by making nuclear weapons obsolete. They'll see that this defensive weapon could be a contributing factor to eliminating such weapons. We're not going to, if we come up with such a weapon, we're not going to stand there and say, okay, now we've got you, we can launch the first attack. I don't think this country is ever in a position where it wants to do that. We don't start wars. We have no intention of starting one now. But what we would then be able to say to them is, look, we're willing to join you. We'll do away with ours. You do away with yours. We've got this thing here now, this defensive weapon. And we're very willing to, to use this, not to enable us to fight you, but to simply do what we both want, and that is get rid of the weapons. Mr. President, let me bring you back home. Leave me aside, David. Hmm? We're about 10 minutes into your next one. So we'll Just a quick one. If I'm, uh, leaving aside David Stockman's indelicate remarks about the military, caring more about their pensions and the security, for which he's apologized, do you agree with the substance of his remarks that the system of military retirement benefits is bloated and the taxpayers shouldn't be bailing out farmers who took out bad loans? Well, right now we're offering a program in which we're hopeful that we can salvage some of those farmers. The situation we're facing today uh, with those farmers is one other people in other lines of work have faced and it's the result of ending an era of building your business on expected inflation. And farmland unfortunately was one of those things that in an inflationary world zoomed in value and then they borrowed on the basis of that as security and when we were successful in bringing down inflation one of the first things that happened was the nose diving of of that land How about the other part of this criticism the military pensions are bloated is he right no i uh, I have to think this is a little different than any other pension program you want to name, the military. The, they go into a, a profession or a business, uh, profession is the word, I guess it should be used, in which they know that, say, in a matter of a certain number of years, even though in any other line of activity they would be literally at their prime, your business or mine or anything else, 
but they know that the physical requirements are such that they're going to be out. Now, there is that, and there is coupled with the sacrifice that is made by the military. I talked to a retired military man. In this case, he was an officer and reached high rank. And he had retired, and then he had found other employment. But he told me that one of the reasons retiring was that in 31 years of his marriage, they sat one night and touted it up. 20 years of the 31, they had been separated from each other. That he, in the call of duty, for 20 of his 31 married years, had not been, he and his wife had not been together. He was out there in the world someplace. And you uh, that's worse than someone running for president. What? That's worse than someone running for president. <laughs> Sir, Larry yeah. Speaks would not forgive me if I didn't ask at least one question about the budget deficit before we, before we uh, leave. Okay, I will, Larry. I knew you'd be mad if I didn't get that in, though. You, with, with you now, in fiscal years 83, 84, and 85, will have budget deficits of about $600 billion. At the same time, uh, unemployment's coming down, uh, inflation is staying around 4%, interest rates have actually come down a little bit. Could it be that maybe these budget deficits really don't matter? Yes, they come to a point where they matter. I've been saying that for about 30 years. I know. Uh, and yet you've run these yes. huge deficits and you're it's, doing it's so well. Just, I think just one of the most wonderful things to see and to hear is to hear my own words coming back at me from over those years by a few Democrats right now who suddenly have discovered deficits. And yet for 50 years, that with the exception of about four years in that 50, they have controlled the Congress of the United States. But why don't they affect, why don't they affect inflation and interest rates and unemployment now if they're so bad? Um, no, what they can do is get to a point in which the total debt, and remember, with all their moaning and crying, the national debt was about a trillion dollars when I came into office. And the first of those major big deficit increases incurred what had occurred after I was in office. However, it was not my responsibility because your first eight months in office, you're on the other fellow's budget. I don't come into office and declare how much we can spend. The budget is there until the following October. In fact, the when the bottom fell out of the economy in July of 81, not one facet of my economic program had been passed as yet. So it couldn't have had anything to do with that deficit. But what is happening now indicates the danger that over the 50 years, the situation keeps getting worse. And let me give you one. When we put into effect the war on poverty, which started in the last half of the 60s and ran through the 70s. And uh, poverty won because uh, the rate of increase in people in poverty increased in spite of the war on poverty, all those great programs. But in the 15 years from 1965 to 1980, the budgets multiplied to five times what they were. The deficit went to 38 times what it had been. So you've got a built-in structural deficit. And the president, to call it the president's budget, the president is responsible for submitting to the Congress what they have required in the programs they have legislated. And the Congress, in turn, if the, when the president, and this is the situation the president's in, when the president submits and says, we can run this program for this amount of money, and it's less than uh, what the Congress thinks you should, the Congress insists that you spend more money. And they even tell you that if at the end of the year there's any money left, you're going to have to spend it before the end of the year. Uh, this is a structural problem, and of course it's, got, it's multiplied and it's gotten worse. And a lot, large part of this had to do with the great fall into recession that occurred in 81 and through 82. And, uh, so there's no question that we're going to be better off and there's not going to be inflation and the things that bother us if we get government back to where 
43 states or so have it, and that is that uh, you can't spend more than government takes in. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it.